Good morning. It's good to have you here. I heard it might be a little muggy outside, uh, but it is nice and sunny. And uh, we do have the fans on here, so hopefully it won't be too terrible for you. Uh, but again, it is a wonderful day and a wonderful opportunity for you to be here with us. We're going to start with a word of prayer. So if you will, bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Lord, we want to be able to thank you for all the uh, wonderful blessings you've given us in our lives. And Lord, that uh, as things come about in our lives and challenges, Lord, may we be reminded uh, of how good you are. And may we be able to stop and, and just be able to take a moment to count those blessings. Lord, we do know we have challenges in our lives and uh, those around us. And so, Lord, we just pray uh, for those people who pray about those things, bringing them to you. We know you are our helper, the one who can bring us comfort and peace, and so we ask that we do that. Lord, we're thankful for this opportunity to be gathered here today where we can worship you, put our focus and our priority on you, and just may we do that in a, a pleasing and acceptable way. May we learn more about you, may we be encouraged about through your word, uh, and may we be able to go out and serve you each and every day. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. mind for the Lord's Supper. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain. Pray to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross Uh, from God's word, but most importantly, I think the the most important act of this service is participating in the Lord's Supper. It's to remind us the sacrifice that was made for us uh, to save us from uh, spending eternity in hell, and it gives us a chance at salvation to where we can spend that in her eternity instead in heaven with with Jesus and with God. I ask now that you. Th Think about the sacrifice that was given in your stead for all of us as we partake of the fruit of the vine. It represents the, the blood of Jesus that was, uh, or the bread, sorry, as it represents the, uh, the body of Jesus as he was uh, given up on the cross in our stead. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask now blessing upon this bread as it represents Jesus' body that was given for us. We ask now that everyone who partakes of it is doing so in a manner pleasing to you, and 
we just ask that we remember the sacrifice that was given in our stead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we'll give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here this morning. We have the privilege of being able to partake in the Lord's Supper. We ask that you please bless this fruit of the vine. Let it remind us of the blood that was given up for us on the cross of Calvary for our sins. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We also have the opportunity to give as we've been prospered um, on the table in the back. If you weren't able to do so on your way in, please remember to on your way out. We live in a a country where we're blessed over and over and over and over. And I believe it's very important, especially Scott gave a wonderful lesson about tithing and about giving. And the, the money given goes to work around the world spreading the gospel of Christ, and also it does a lot of work just locally in this area. So I ask that when you give, you give with a a cheerful heart and, you know, and, and do so in a loving manner, and I'll ask a blessing on that giving. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day again, and thank you for the opportunity we have to give and to to spread your word around the world and to try to bring as many souls to you as possible. Please let us be cheerful in our giving and do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found, Lord plant my feet on high. to stay where doubts arise and fear dismay though some may dwell where these abound my prayer my aim is higher ground lord lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than i have found lord plant my feet on higher ground I want to live above the world where Satan's done, dive me a home. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're singing four songs now in service instead of two. <sighs> Thank you. Number 616. 
616. It's been a long week. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now say, am I love lifted me? Again, it is uh, good to be here this morning. I was checking online to see how, if anyone was there. Uh, it looks like Dave and Chris, they are out of town. They are on vacation this week. But Dave, Chris, Jilly, and Cade are on the live stream. And then also the Hills are out of town this week uh, in Massachusetts. And they are at least on the live stream with us as well. There may be a few others, and we're glad you are. We're glad for those that are here today. Uh, as we can look out and we can see there are fathers here, as we can look out and see there are uh, children, sons, and daughters here today, it is, uh, again, a great opportunity to be gathered with family, a great opportunity gathered with friends as we put our focus upon God. As uh, we take time just briefly this morning uh, to worship God in song, in prayer, and as Jeremy led the table, as we took our minds back to the cross and what Jesus did for the world, and as today, we'll be able to go through and look through God's Word and talk about a faithful father. If you look there, you'll see the passage is Luke 15, 11 through 32. That's where we're going to spend uh, our, our time this morning is in Luke 15, 11 through 32. Uh, that passage happens to deal with the uh, prodigal son. Uh, the lost son is also talked about because Jesus had just told two parables uh, he told one of a sheep that was lost, and he tells a parable of a coin that is lost. And so we may make some comparisons to those, those accounts as well. But our focus is going to be on the account of the lost son, and not so much of the son who goes away from his father, but to look at the father and really get to better understand him. Now, the title is Faithful Father, and that means one who is reliable. And so I thought this image did a really good job of describing a faithful father, and I, I realize it's a, perhaps a little small, hard to see, so I'll read it to you. But it has father as a definition, or the word to define. It goes on defining father as one who's a protector, a teacher, an encourager, 
One who picks you up when you fall, which again goes very well with the passage today. The one who brushes you off and lets you try again. I like this. It says, see also. Words that may also describe a father. And the very first word is banker. Hopefully you're not only a banker to your children, to those in your family, but a banker, a hero, a playmate, and a coach. And so I do want to just say that there are, I'm sure, some here today who may not have the best relationship with fathers uh, in their life. Uh, of not, their father was not someone who is faithful, someone who is reliable. And, and so uh, when a day like this comes about on the calendar, when a sermon like this comes about, it may be hard for you to deal with. Uh, of hopefully you can actually be encouraged by what we read of how this father treated his son. And as we'll see that Jesus, when he tells us this account, he's telling us this because he's really portraying that father as our heavenly father, God. And so that you and I can take rest that we do have a heavenly father who is faithful, one who is reliable to us. And again, may that be a source of encouragement for you today. When we look at Luke 15, these are the three things we want to take note of. We want to see that the father allows the son to make a choice. He allows him some freedom to go and do what he thinks is right. And so uh, some of you know that Hannah and I are in the process. We want to adopt, but as of today, it's just Hannah and I at our house, kind of nice and quiet. But of there, of understanding that you do, you want to teach your children to do the right thing. You want to be there and monitor what's going on in their lives. But there is a time as they grow up and as they mature There are going to be times where you have to let them make the choice. You can teach them every day, all day, but they won't learn the lesson until they fall on their face, until they make the mistake, until they have to face the consequences. And this father understood that. And so he allows his son to make that choice. Even though the son makes that choice and it's the wrong decision, yet what we'll see in Luke 15, that when the son returns... The father is not prideful, not boastful, doesn't condemn him, doesn't say, well, I was right, you were wrong, I told you so, but has compassion on the son. That as a father, as we talked today, but that as parents, that you would have compassion for your children. And then lastly, we'll see is we're told that this son was not the only son the man had. He had two sons. And so he has had to be patient with the older brother, his older son, didn't quite understand why it was such a celebratory uh, day. Why, why such should take place for a son who was lost, for a son who ha- had wasted the inheritance. Well, why is this? I've been faithful and true to you, and yet there's been no party for me. But we're going to understand that a little bit better as we look to Luke 15. Before we do that, if you're turning there, the first passage we're going to look at is verse 11 through 13. And so again, as you turn there, I just want to share with you this uh, song. The song is by Tyler Wood. I believe he's a country singer, and he has a song entitled, Dad. Very appropriate for today. But the lyrics say this. An early riser, always on timer. A backbreaker, giver, not a taker. Made sure nothing was missing, so we could have everything you didn't. A patient teacher, strong, steady leader. Firm handshaker, never met a stranger, tough as steel, heart of gold. It took a while, but now I know all the little life lessons. A spirit lifter, problem fixer, words of reason. There when you need them, calm you down, set you straight. Yeah, I appreciate all the little life lessons. I just call you when I'm lost, when I'm empty, when I need a little help. Whenever I get good news, you're the first one I want to tell. So I want to thank you, give you a pat on the back for doing what you did. No questions asked. I could never say enough to, through the up, downs and the ups. You carried the weight so we'd have a good life. Raised us with love so we could fly. Anyone else would call you Superman. And I know I'm the man I am because I call you Dad. And encourage you, if you have time today, to go and, and watch that and read over those things. But again, some of you have had a father like that. And is encouraging to you. And hopefully as we talk today about this father. And you're reminded about God. Your heavenly father. Understand that he is reliable. He is faithful. A good father that will take care of you. Be there with you. So the first passage we want to look at. Is in Luke 15. 11 through 13. Where we see the father allows the son to make a choice. Again the wrong choice. But he allows him that freedom. It says this. 
Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he, the father, divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. I understand that that prodigal living, a wasteful living, one that was not beneficial. He didn't go and store up those things. He didn't go and invest his livelihood, uh, but had wasted his inheritance. That's what he's asking from his father. A father, I know I'm protected in this home. I know things are good here, but I think I know something better. I think I know better than you, and I think something is awaiting for me out there. There are things I want to go and experience, uh, and so I'm going to leave the house. Now, we're never told of the ages of the brothers, just simply that this was the younger brother, and he thought it was best for him to leave home. There's better things out there. And again, we see that the father allows him to make that choice. Again, sometimes the best way for people to learn is for them to fall and learn about consequences. Now, what we, uh, in the two previous parables, right in Luke 15, it starts off not here. We start in verse 11. But Jesus is talking. Uh, he's engaging with sinners and tax collectors. Some Jews, some Pharisees see Jesus doing this thing. And they question, how is it, Jesus, how is it you can spend time with sinners and tax collectors? These people who have wasted their life, these people who are enemies of God. And so he tells them. He tells them three accounts, three parables. The first being a shepherd with a hundred sheep, 99 who stay, but one goes astray. And what we read in that account is that the shepherd leaves the 99 to go searching for the lost sheep. In the second account, he tells about a woman who has coins, and she loses a coin, and she goes searching for the lost coin. And we're told that when those things that were lost but are found, there is great rejoicing of when a sinner uh, repents and turns back to God, there's much rejoicing. But what you'll find to be different in this parable that he gives is there's a relationship between a father and a son, and that the father freely allows the son to leave without chasing after him. He's not the shepherd, he's not the one looking for the coin, but the father allows the son to freely make the choice, and he waits at home. He waits at home for the son to make the choice. If the son made the choice to leave, then it's going to have to take the son to make the choice to come back. And so as we talk about that and we think about us as God's children, as we think about us and how it is that we have may have chosen to freely leave God, chosen to sin, go against God, that God is, again, just like this father, waiting for us, waiting for us to realize what wrong we've done, to realize that we should not have left God, but that we need to return back to him. And so God is waiting God is waiting there for you to return home. That you would no longer remain lost, but that you would be found. So if you look at verse 20, we'll also look at verse 24. We'll see just what takes place when the son returns home. Again, the father allowed the son to leave. He doesn't go searching, chasing after him. We're told the the son goes off to a far country. He wasn't wasn't just down the street. It wasn't as if the father could check in on him with him. He couldn't send him an email. Uh, They didn't have (laughs) access to internet at that time. But uh, of understanding, uh, Hill, as he stood at his home, of watching and waiting, looking to see, will today be the day that my son comes home? Will this be the day that our family will be reunited? And so, Luke 15, 20 and 24. Starting in verse 20, it says this, And he arose and came to his father, But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Had compassion on the son. And it says this, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So again, you imagine of understanding what Jesus is telling these people. If you can, as you sit there and you read it yourself, of understanding here was a son who went to a far country, went and took his livelihood, took from his father some possessions, some money. And has left. But he returns. He realizes the wrong in his life. And the son says, I'm not worthy to become 
your son again. That was too high of a position that I squandered. I, I turned away from that position. If I could just come back as a hired hand, as I could just become a servant for my father, it would be far better than what the world has given me out here. So he returns home, and as he's afar off, the father sees him, has compassion, has love and care, concern for his son, and it tells us the actions that follow that compassion. He runs to the son. He doesn't wait for him to come up to the house, but he runs to him, falls on his neck, and kisses his son. Now, why would a father have compassion on a son? Now, why would a father do such things? Verse 24. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. You understand that the father, again, had no connection, no way of knowing how the son was doing. And so what that means is that the son was truly lost. The father was never told, well, I'll be back in a month. I'll be back in a few days. The son had just left. The son may have never returned home. But yet the father waited. And so the son was lost. And if the son, if he never saw his son, the son was as good as dead. But yet... Yet the son returning home, he was no longer lost, but he is found. And he's no longer dead, but is alive. And so that was truly a wonderful day for the father. Something truly to rejoice over for. Again, we do not see this father going out and searching for his son, but yet he still has compassion for him. Still is able to love his son once he has returned home. Once the son has made the choice, realized the wrong in his life, made the choice to return, we see that love that care being shown between the two of them. And we see of running to him and holding him because the father wanted the son to feel at home and to feel safe, taken care of. And so again, it is as we think about this and we think about our relationship with God, that yes, while we may have sinned, yet while we have turned our backs on God, if we would return to him, that he'll be willing to accept us, that he will take us back in, not as servants, as a lower position, but as his children, as his son, as his daughter. And isn't that truly wonderful? Truly to know that God is there waiting for us to return, that God is there and will be compassionate towards us. Yet while we uh, had turned our back, yet he is going to be concerned for us and want to make us feel at home. So hopefully, as a Christian today, that's something you can uh, understand, that that's something you can ag agree with. And then if you look lastly at Luke 15, Luke 15, we'll look at verse 28 and then 30, 31 through 32. So we see Jesus telling those Jews that day about a lost son, one who leaves his father, one where the father allows the son to leave. But once the son returns, there's much rejoicing. There's much gladness that takes place. But understand, again, Jesus is still speaking to people who question, why would you do this? And so Jesus perhaps explained this the best uh, in this parable with the older brother, the older brother who doesn't understand why there is this celebration. Verse 28. But he was angry. That is the older brother. He was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him, pleaded with his older son uh, uh, to really get him to understand why these things are happening. So verse 31 through 32, he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. So Jesus is talking to these Jews who ask, why is it that you're with these sinners? Why is it that you're with these tax collectors? Because while they are lost in sin, I'm hoping, I'm praying that they will repent. I'm hoping that they will return back to the Father. They'll turn away from those things uh, contrary to God's word, but that by me spending time with them, by me teaching them, they would come back. Just like this father. Of, well, why is it that you're spending time with a son who would go and waste his livelihood. Why would you do such things? Because he was lost and he is found. Because he was dead and is alive again. Instead of the father getting upset about this son and just saying, well, if he doesn't want to enjoy the party, if he can't appreciate what we're doing, let's just keep him on the outside. 
if he can't rejoice and he can't understand why this is a celebration, we'll just ignore him. But yet the father still went after the other son. He cares. Both were his sons. He didn't favor one son over the other. God doesn't favor you or I over one another. But yet, with us being his children, he wants all of us to be able to come home. He wants all of us to be able to join in and be able to be gathered together, to dwell with one another. What we can see then is, is when the focus is on us, it is hard to celebrate the good going on in others' lives. When that son was focused on himself and how faithful, how obedient he had been to the father, he couldn't rejoice when the lost son had returned. He couldn't rejoice when his own brother, who was lost, who had no contact with, had returned home. Hopefully that's not the case for you and I, as we have people that are added into the church, as people who are lost in sin but repent, are united with Christ through baptism, as they are joined into the church, you and I would be able to go in and rejoice with them. We wouldn't be on the outside. We wouldn't be like those Jews questioning, how can this be? But yet we'd realize what took place. We would realize that these who were lost are now found. These people have to answer for his own uh, consequences. Now, there's only so much he could do in understanding that, again, if you are a parent, if you're just like this father, you would have compassion on them. Yes, you were right. That's understood. You knew better. You've had more experience. But to be able to have compassion of when they return, being able to, to bring them back into the fold, yet they were lost, but now they're brought back into a right relationship with you. And to be patient. There will be those who won't understand why it's such a glorious and wonderful thing, but yet to be patient. Again, Hannah and I will be able to go home today to a quiet, peaceful home. I'm sorry for all of you. But as you go and as you have those loud and uh, chaotic homes, that you would be able to be patient with one another, that you'd be understanding of one another and be able to do that, do that well. Again, as we think about these things, as you as fathers, as we think about these things concerning the, the Father in the parable, we can also think about our Father in heaven who has shown us these things, is willing for us to make the choice to return back to him, is willing to show us compassion, one who's patient enough to be willing to, to endure and suffer long for us to come home so we may be brought into the fold with him. If you are here today and if you are someone who is lost, if you are someone who has turned to sin, turned in, gave into temptation, but need to be brought into the dwelling place with God, if you need to be united with Christ, then you have that opportunity today. You have the opportunity to repent, turn from sin, and turn to God. You have the opportunity to confess Jesus, acknowledge who he is as the Son of God, the Christ and the Son of God, and be united with Christ through baptism. It's through that unifying and baptism uh, of no longer tied to sin, but you're tied with Christ, united with him, no longer stained with sin and the guilt, but yet you become spotless and blameless, and it's truly wonderful. But if you are a Christian here today, and you're that son who stayed home, you're faithful, obedient, but you have to start to realize perhaps there's something going on in your life, and perhaps you haven't been as faithful as you think you have. You haven't been as obedient as you ought to have been in if you need prayers, encouragement, if we can study God's word with you, help you in any way, we ask that you come forward and have a stand scene, the invitation song.
pray with me? Dear God, our Lord and Father in heaven, we're thankful, Father, to be here this morning. We're thankful, Father, for all the blessings you have bestowed upon each one of us. We're most indeed thankful, Father, for your son, Jesus, and his suffering and dying on the cross for each one of us so that we may have that hope of a home in heaven with you if we have obeyed your will. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who are sick and unable to be here, that you would bless and strengthen each and every one of them and comfort and care them and help them that they might be able to have a safe trip to their destination and that they'll be able to make it back to their home safely. We ask you, Father, that you would help us that we might be able to come back once again this evening, that we might be able to hear another portion from your word. We ask you, Father, that you would forgive us of our sins and in death save us when our lives come to an end here on this earth. For this prayer, blessings and favors we'd ask in Jesus' name, amen. That's okay. Uh, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. Um, and first anniversary, wedding anniversary to Isaac and Michaela. So congratulations. Um, reminders that the uh, updates for the World uh, Video Bible School and Search for Lord's Way and Potter's Children's Homes are in the bulletin board in the back. Jensen's uh, graduation party is next Saturday, 1 to 4 over the house. If the weather is nice, if not, it'll be here. The Youth Debo will be that Sunday after um, in the building at 4.30. Also, um, July 25th through the 30th, the Midwestern Children's Home um, trip down there. So if you're interested in going down and doing some work down there, that's then. Uh, or if you'd like to send some supplies or drink snacks, that sort of thing, please see Mike Pittman. Also, just uh, again for the calendar, September 16th through the 19th will be our gospel meeting here. Are there any other announcements I've overlooked, Miss? Teresa? Um, yes. Um, on the back table, there are two pair of brand new Hendrix flats. Um, that they're for dancing at the Johnny Depp Museum. So if anyone needs some pants or slacks that are back there, yes, sir. Ten AM, July tenth. Okay. Okay. All right. Have a great afternoon tonight, six PM if you're if you're able to come back. That'd be great. <laughs> 